Well, the Psalms express just about every human emotion that human beings experience. And I mean every emotion, even anger. And I think that many Christian readers become very troubled when they read what are called the imprecatory Psalms in the Old Testament. So I wanted to take some time and just kind of walk through and think through these imprecatory Psalms in hopes of discerning what significance they have for the church today. What significance is there for Christians? So first of all, what is an imprecatory Psalm? That's important to answer. So they are those Psalms in which the author calls for God to act justly and bring judgment upon his enemies. Some examples of imprecatory psalms include Psalm 5, Psalm 10, Psalm 109, Psalm 140, and others as well. And many Christians, they, they read these and they suggest that there's really not any room for imprecatory psalms in, in the life of a Christian. So they come along and suggest that, that it is nothing more than a sinful expression of angry human beings that should never be done by Christians. But you know, if that's the case, what, is, what does that mean for the imprecatory Psalms in the Bible? I mean, should we, should we somehow stop when we get to these verses and, and just give lessons about how Christians should not be praying such things? So let me answer this by walking through an example, I think, of, of an imprecatory prayer. So look at what David prays, for example, in Psalm 3. In verse 6, he says, I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people, Salem. Here's the first lesson. It is not wrong to pray for God's justice on evildoers. What a prayer by David, right? Think about this. David prays, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, strike all my enemies on the cheek. You know, he says, break the teeth of the, of the wicked. So there are those that would come along and suggest that David's prayer is sinful, that he should be praying for his enemies to change. He should be praying for them, them to repent. Why is he praying for them to be destroyed? But in my view, David is not doing anything wrong by calling for God to take vengeance. So let me illustrate this for a moment. I heard about a, a story of a python that was called Bessie, and she was accidentally set loose in an Idaho apartment complex. It was an absolute disaster. Eventually, the six-foot reptile was found in the walls and slithering among all the pipes. But for two weeks straight, the residents were panicked. They had been nervously checking under all of their beds. Many of the, the residents were were losing sleep at night because they were so afraid. Some of the residents even decided to, to move for a time to a friend's house because they were afraid of being attacked in the middle of the night by this python. Well, eventually, Bessie was caught. And one resident was quoted as saying, we will all definitely sleep better now. Don't you see that for David to have security, for David to experience full salvation, a full salvation from his enemies, they have to be destroyed. David wrote this in the context in which his enemies were trying, trying to destroy him and destroy his kingdom. So there's no safety for him, there's no safety for his people until his enemies are eliminated. You find a similar prayer in Revelation 6 by a group of Christian martyrs. We read in verse 9, John says in Revelation, he says, when, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So John has the vision of the Christian martyrs of history, right? They're, they're crying out for God's justice. They're calling for God to avenge their blood as martyrs. There's nothing wrong with crying out for God's justice. You see, Absalom had no right to the throne. He had no right to dishonor his father David. He had no right to usurp his kingship. It was absolute injustice. God invites us to pray honestly to him. God invites us to talk to him, even talk with him about what makes us angry. 
He has no problem with, with us asking him to bring justice. Lesson two, although it is good to pray for God's justice, we must never demand it in this life. You see, the imprecatory Psalms communicate a deep yearning for justice. And, and, and they're written from the point of view of those people that had been severely oppressed. But understand, these Psalms were not written out of a vindictiveness or, or a need for any kind of personal vengeance. For example, in Psalm 3, we don't find David asking God for the resources and the opportunity to take revenge on the wrongdoers. We don't read that. In his prayer, he asks God to take vengeance. He's not commanding God to do anything. He's just simply asking him. So this prayer, it conforms to the words of Romans 12, in which Paul says about God, revenge is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So in the context of every imprecatory prayer in the Bible, it was right for the psalmist to pray for the destruction of the wicked because of the fact that they were praying for God to do something that he must ultimately do because of his nature. Eventually, eventually God will judge all evildoers. Not in this life perhaps, but he will in the next. And because these prayers themselves were uttered by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it was not immoral for them to pray them. And it is not immoral for, for us to pray these psalms either. But we must never demand God to move speedily and to execute his justice. And this leads to the last lesson. There's nothing wrong with praying for God's justice, but there's also nothing wrong with seeking his mercy. You see, Jesus quoted a number of imprecatory psalms. He saw nothing immoral about the use of them, even about praying them. That being said, he also instructed us to love our enemies and to pray for them. We read in Matthew 5, 43 to 44, you have learned that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You see, it's not wrong to pray for God's justice. It's not wrong at all. But we must also regularly consider praying for his mercy. If you are a genuine follower of Jesus, understand this, he has granted you mercy, right? Remember that God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. So perhaps Christian discernment must be used here. Yes, we can always pray for God's justice, but we can also seek his great mercy. Above all, according to Romans 12, we should seek God's will in everything that we do. And when we are wronged by someone, we need to pray righteous prayers and leave the outcome to the Lord. For he is the king and he knows exactly what is best. For me, I have a proclivity towards mercy. There are people that are justice people. There are people that are mercy people. I don't know that one's right and one's wrong. I think they're both good. I have that kind of proclivity towards mercy. And uh, at the same time, though, there are plenty of times in which I'm praying for God's justice to take hold. Well, if you've been helped by this in any way, I would love for you to smash the like button that will push this video out to more and more people that can truly be helped by it. Well, thank you so much, and God bless you in the way.